Zainul, you are you are on mute. Okay, so kau tahu bahagian tu. And uh, good uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Zainul. I'm from the School of Chemical and Energy Engineering, uh, Faculty of Engineering, University of Technology Malaysia, uh, Johor Bahru, Skudai. Um, today uh, we're going to have our uh, next uh, distinguished lecture series, uh, hosted by the UTM Faculty of Engineering or we call it as UTM Engineering. Um, today, we are very uh, fortunate and grateful to have the presence of uh, Professor Jose Antonio Tezera, all the way from Portugal. Uh, grateful because uh, because he yeah, can spend some of his precious time to be with us today. Uh, and also very grateful as well because uh, he uh, is now uh, in the very early morning over there in uh, Portugal in Min uh, Mino. Yeah, so uh, we are very thankful for him uh, to him for that. So uh, maybe a little bit about how we get to know each other. So we uh, were always attending uh, uh, conferences, uh, mainly uh, which is organized by the uh, Indian Biotechnology Institute, in, uh, Indian Biotechnology Society. So that's where we get to know uh, um, people who are working in the same research area, notably in the in the area of bioprocessing, biological engineering biotechnology and uh, and uh, stuff like that uh, food yeah so uh, uh, if uh, we still remember uh, last week we have uh, professor hector all the way from mexico giving uh, his sharing in this series so just to uh, share uh, professor hector was uh, doing his phd under the supervision of our uh, esteemed speaker today uh, jose yeah, so uh, without further ado, I would like, uh, I think I would like to invite our uh, distinguished dean, uh, Professor Rafiq, to introduce our uh, honorary speaker today. Over to you, bro. Thank you, Zainul. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome, everyone, to our 109th UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq, and I'm the Dean of Engineering University Technology, Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Jose Antonio Texera from Universidad Domino, Portugal. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Jose Antonio Texera is currently Professor at Biological Engineering Department, University of Minho, since 2000. He has a degree in Chemical Engineering from University of Porto in 1980 and a PhD in chemical engineering, also from the same university in 1988. Jose Antonio Texera has been developing his research activities in two main areas, industrial biotechnology, including bioprocess development for the valorization of agro-industrial residues and new design bioreactors and continuous, continuous processing and food biotechnology, which includes non-conventional food processing and food nanotechnology. He supervised and still supervising numerous researchers, including 52 PhD students and 25 postdocs. He was the principal investigator in 39 projects with external financial support. He edited six books and published more than 600 papers in peer reviewed journals. His current H index is 74 under Scopus ISI and being named a highly cited researcher in 2018, 2019, and last year, 2020. So that is a brief biography of our distinguished speaker today. Here now is Professor Jose Antonio Texera from Universidad Domino, Portugal, with a lecture entitled Biopolymers from Lignocellulose as a Tool for the Development of New Materials. Professor Jose Antonio Texera, over to you. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to start uh, thanking the invitation for making a presentation in this series of lectures. It's quite a pleasure. It's quite a pleasure uh, uh, to meet you, meet you all. Um, and it would be great if I could be there. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, uh, nowadays, it's a little difficult to travel. But I think that uh, new opportunities will come up. And um, both uh, of you can come to Portugal, or, or people there can come to Portugal, I, and I can go there, there to, to, to Malaysia. So I think that um, that will happen sooner or later. So 
Um, once again, thank you for for uh, allowing me to give this this presentation. Um, when deciding um, when deciding the presentation that I could make, um, as you could see, um, okay, I've been doing research for several years now, lots, and I had to find a, a, a focus for this presentation, and so I decided to, in a way. Uh, relate some of the work we have been doing with linoslogic materials with pos possible applications in food industry, in particular in packaging systems. So that's why I call this presentation, and let's see if this works. Share screen, Sh share screen. Okay. Just confirm that it, it's appearing. Yes, yes, we can see your PowerPoint slides. Okay, so as I said, I, I try to, you know, way to combine the work we are doing on linoslogic materials with the use or development of new materials, in particular for food applications. Uh, anyway, uh, before detailing a little or going uh, on my presentation, I'll make just a very brief presentation of the place where I come from. As it was told, um, uh, I come from Portugal, so all, almost in the other side of the world uh, compared to Malaysia. Really, I was checking, we have an eight hour difference at the moment. I think it, in Malaysia it's 4 p.m., here it's 8 a.m. So uh, I, 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 I come from Portugal, I, I really live in Portugal, and um, as you can see, Portugal, um, Let's say it's a rectangle, and I live in this part, northwest part of Portugal. Really, I live in Porto. Um, I think people know Porto better than Braga. That's the place where the, the University of Ming is located. So, University of Ming is located here between Braga and, and Braga and Guimarães. Um, so, very close to Porto. Let's say fifty kilometers of, uh, away from Porto. Um, this is a very interesting place to visit, by the way. Uh, Braga is a really a very old town. It dates, it dates back to the Roman times. It's a very religious town also. Uh, and there's very nice places to visit, as I said, not, uh, not only in the town, but also uh, outside. We have the, uh, a national park nearby. It's a very nice place to visit. And those who like to to go to nature, like to walk, have very nice places to, to be. Um, talking about the, the university, uh, so the university is a relatively new university. It was created in 1973. And I work at the Department of Biological Engineering, that is the unit related with the teaching, and also at the Center of Biological Engineering, that is the the research unit linked to the Department of Biological Engineering. So th this is this Center of Biological Engineering, as you can see, is a research center located at the University of Minho. Uh, it has been graded always as excellent since in, in, uh, its beginning. And we work on advanced training, technology transfer, consulting and services at the agro-food health and environmental health and environmental sectors, okay? And we go from the molecular uh, scale to process scale. So that's an overview of uh, the, the, the main research activities we have at this, uh, this research center. Uh, at the moment, we are a team of uh, 120 uh, people with a PhD and uh, uh, around the same number of PhD stu students. Uh, within the center, um, uh, we have several research groups, and uh, the research group I'm involved with and that I coordinate is what I call B-Factor Research Group. And as you can see here, this is a very simple scheme showing the, the activities we developed within the group. And uh, um, our starting point is the valorization of natural resources and, and ways, and we have a, a, a research line that goes from treatment of this raw material, so by fractionating it, and then developing new processes, mainly bioprocesses, uh, for, for the obtention of added value products. Um, and 
supporting this line of research, we have competences on what we call cell factory. So we go from uh, metabolic to physiological studies on different organisms. And we also work on the development of new bioreactors uh, with the intensified, let's say, characteristics for, in particular, for hydrodynamic and mass transfer. And also we have been working on uh, continuous, continuous, continuous bioreactors. I have to say that lots of this work has been focused on bioethanol production, but we are really moving from bioethanol. Although most of the challenges we have for bioethanol production um, can be shared with other products we'd like to have. And from that, so from this line of research, we also extended our activities to food technology and work on, uh, I, I, as it was said before, on um, development of bio-based materials, in particular for, for packaging, but not only, and also on innovative processing technologies, extraction technologies, and in particular, we have been focusing on our work on the use of moderate electric fields um, uh, with two main objectives. One, um, develop uh, use these electric fields as an extraction technology and also uh, as a way of restructuring food materials. Okay, and th this gives really an overview of the main research activities I have within, within, within the group. So uh, for today, um, I decided to, to make uh, um, a presentation of what we've been doing uh, on, on the use of these lignocellulosic materials, in particular, the lignin fraction of these lignocellulosic materials for its incorporation in, 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 in films. Um, and uh, as you know, we have lots of natural polymers. Some of them are really being, are really being exploited. For instance, guar gum and lacospin gun are ve very much used in the, in the food industry. And we have lots of other materials. We have uh, uh, um, uh, catazen, we have uh, from, from French shrimps, uh, we have alginate from algae, uh, we have uh, pec uh, pectins, um, and we also have uh, cellulose and lignin. Okay, and but but overall, we have readily available amount of what we call lignocellulosic materials. Not forgetting anyway, chitosan and pectin and so on. But we have re uh, available large amounts of lignocellulosic materials, and uh, that drove us to to study uh, the transformation and use of lignocellulosic feedstocks. Okay. And why doing this? Because uh, they have um, uh, a great biotechnological value and, and you can get really a high and uh, different added value products from, from, from these lignocellulosic materials. They are available in high amounts, okay? And at low cost, uh, they are a renewable source of energy. So in a way, they can replace the traditional petroleum re refineries and we can develop biorefineries. And very important also, they don't compete with food crops. And so we have, uh, um, let's say, a substrate and a material that is available in large amounts at low cost and can really open and uh, allow for development of this biorefinery bio contact concept and also uh, uh, contribute to the, the, the objective, the, the, the global goals that have been defined by the, the United Nations. Um, this is really a, just a table showing the high amounts of um, materials we have available at the reduced cost. And we can see really that most of these wastes, let's say, come from the, from, have a, um, um, and a uh, slot material present in, in huge amounts, but we also have the other materials like corn residues, cassava residues, uh, uh, in Europe, lots of materials from, from, from several processing industries and so on. And, uh, uh, I also would like to, to to highlight an, another very interesting material that is not a lignocellulosic material. And that's a material we've been working for some time and now we, that, we have not worked so much on that. 
but that's a st that was one of the first materials we worked with is the way cheese way that you get from 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 making cheese and where you can uh, have uh, uh, very very large amounts of this material and uh, really there are lots of companies nowadays that uh, transform cheese whey in different added value compounds namely protein uh, ethanol and, and and other derivatives um anyway i'll stick to dinoslosic materials and uh, the point is that we have huge amounts of these materials available at, at low, low cost um, and if you go to the composition of these linoslosic materials, um, you can see that we have three main um, compounds present, or group of compounds. We have cellulose, hemislose, and lignin, and we also have what we call extractives. And uh, basically, you can see that depends on the material that is being considered, on the original of the, the material. In this case, we're talking about waste. But overall, I would say that we can say roughly that we have one third of cellulose, one third of hemicellulose, and one third of lignin, and, and then variable of amounts of these ex, um, amounts of these extractives. Um, and so, when talking about the valorization of these materials, we have really to consider the valorization of these different fractions. Really, in the beginning, we were mostly focused on cellulose. But it's clear that the success of the industry based on transformation of these linoslosic materials has to be focused on the development of, of um, uh, um, uses for all these components of these materials. Uh, and we can say roughly here that we have, as I said, um, uh, these, these three main components, cellulose, that is, as you know, a polymer of glucose. We have, um, we have hemicelloses, mostly uh, a polymer of xylose, but not only. Other um, monomers can be present, like arabinose, for instance. And we also have lignin. And um, we can really look at the different applications if we are able to uh, um, separate or fractionate these linoslosic materials from this from this starting from this starting um, products. Okay, from these starting materials that like what you here: sugar cane, sweet corn, bagasse, arva sweets, corn cobs, and so on. So, really, there's a, there is a, a huge potential of, on, on the use of these linoslosic materials. We have to find the way to make this economically viable. And on um the treatment or the recovery or the use of these materials at least at least uh, has to do as i said with the valorization of their constituents and for this we need to develop a cost effective process we need to develop at, as green as possible pretreatment technologies and also important we need to implement a flexible bio refinery that can operate with different different kinds of feedstocks. Um, I think that for some places in the world, even for Portugal, uh, we should be as flexible as possible and not be depending, not depend on just one source of these linoslosic materials. Obviously, um, this uh, operation of biorefinery uh, is depending on the chemical composition, physical properties and structural characteristics of materials that are going to be used. Another way of seeing this is as, I, is, as it's shown here. Uh, so uh, this, uh, in this part, uh, we look at the bioresources. In this figure, we look at the bioresources. And uh, we consider agro waste and biomass waste as the main bioresources to be evaluated. And uh, here, the idea is a little to highlight the importance of other compounds other than just cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin that can be extracted in the first step, okay? Because we can have some added value compounds in there. And then we can use what is left there for this biorefinery concept, where we can make use of different technologies for their transformation. And here I am not talking just about fermentation process. I'm also talking about thermochemical and uh, process and biochemical based process. So really uh, we have to, to think that, that we need to integrate different 
ways of processing these materials. And in the end, we can have really high added value products obtained from these bioresources. Um, if we want, we can also detail a little more um, and make a, um, a conceptual design of biorefinery, considering different options for the use of linoslogic feedstocks. And as you can see, and this is a very simple scheme, but, but it highlights what kind of materials and what kind of strategies we can use for this uh, for developing uh, this material, this process based on linoslogic materials. So. Uh, on one hand, we have what we call physical chemical treatments, and on the other hand, we have we, what we call chemical biological pretreatments. And I'd like to highlight this: if you develop these physical chemical treatments, physical physical chemical treatments, typically we we get a fraction that is rich on cellulose and lignin, and another uh, liquid fraction that is liquid on uh, on M that is rich on M M cellulose. And we, if we apply these chemical biological pretreatments, uh, we get a, a fraction rich in cellulose and amicellulose and another rich, rich in lignin. So you, you can see there's a slight, there's a difference between the, the first products, we, the first fractions we get according to the treatment we, we apply. And from there, you, you can uh, go all the way through to get to different products. As I said before, uh, ethanol has been the, the main objective uh, and was the starting material, let's say, for the use, the starting objective for the biotransformation of linoslogic materials, um, and still is nowadays. And it's still a challenging uh, process to be, and that still needs to be optimized. Um, and as I said, we can get ethanol, we can get other materials, we can get uh, uh, biocomposites, we can get uh, antioxidants, for instance, from the lignin fraction. Nowadays, it's becoming quite irrelevant due to, to the prebiotic potential they have, the, the production of shosh, zilooligosaccharides. Okay, and this is from the uh, using this this uh, flow chart. But if you go to this side of the figure, we can also typically have uh, once again ethanol, and you can have other products. But but basically, uh, what we have is the same type. We can here also have xylitol. But basically, what you can have is the same time of, pro of products, but using different approaches for its uh, purification. Anyway, we have challenges to be to be solved in these in these different treatments. We have to increase the yield. When using enzymes, we need to have very efficient enzymes. That this this has been a challenge for some years to have efficient, in particular, cellulases for the biodegradation of cellulose. We need to use uh, uh, as green as possible solvents for the processing of these materials. And we have to, to take into account the formation of inhibitory compounds that sometimes occur during these processes. And for instance, may inhibit the, the, the activity, uh, not only enzymes, but also of the microbial, microbials on the biotransformation, for instance, for the case of ethanol. Uh, detailing a little the, the processes that we can use uh, for the pretreatments, pre uh, we have been working on autohydrolysis, uh, uh, basically where you use water, pressurized water under uh, uh, specific conditions. Uh, you can see here you can go up to 220 to 210 degrees centigrade, and and you uh, um, make a treatment using this temperature time. Um, uh, diagram okay and the use of um, water uh, presents some advantages as no corrosion no sludge no cellulose degradation low capital and operational costs okay and as i said it's a process as i said before it's a process where you mix linoslogic materials with water we you, you eat them and then you get the liquid phase where mostly you have oligosaccharides from hemicellulose uh, uh, hydrolysis and uh Sometimes, yeah, depending on the conditions you apply here, the, the, the severity, of, severity of the conditions you apply here, you can have degradation compounds, in particular, furfural hydroxymethyl and phthalic compounds, that can have an impact in the falling phase of processing. And then you have a solid phase that is a solid rich in cellulose and in lignin. And really, 
disse pretreatment enhance the accessibility of the enzymes to the to the to the cellulose okay and then you can do an enzymatic hydrolysis step and then proceed with the, uh, the 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 rest of the process another alternative that we have been working with is the organosol process organosol based process where here in a, in a similar way in a, a reactor you apply heat and then you add a, a, a solvent for instance like glycerol you can use ethanol or others uh, but mainly glycerol and ethanol have been used and you can use um you get you get two different phases one black liquor where in this case you have the hemicellulose but also the lignin and the solid phase where you have the, the basically the cellulose okay and it's also a very clean let's say in a very green process that can be used apart from that glycerol or even ethanol uh, can be recovered and recycled in the process as i said um uh, there are several strategies. I just presenting here some examples of things we've been doing, but I'm not going to detail this. For instance, as I said before, that we need not to be depending on just one raw material. And for instance, what we did in, uh, here was to use different biomasses and make different mixtures according to their availability throughout the year and evaluate the efficiency of the process for the of the pretreatment process. Really, I have to say that this work is about to be concluded, and here we also work on the use of these uh, materials we got after the pretreatment for for the production of lactic acid. Using these biomasses are readily available in Portugal, and uh, really no one cares about them. They are they are available, and you just uh, need to collect them. And this is the overall balance of the uh, of the pretreatments concerning the, the different uh, parts of the process. Uh, we have been working also with lots of materials coming from 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 different uh, waste and byproducts. You can see here several uh, brewer spent grains, uh, uh, um, a byproduct, of a very uh, uh, a byproduct that have in large amounts from, from, from the beer industry, corn husks, corn cob, wheat straw, and so on. And in this case, you can see that the, the autohydrol treatment uh, really allowed us to um, uh, improve, let's say, the, 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 the properties of the, of the solids for further processing by uh, achieving the objectives to we expect to be achieved uh, as said before and then obviously by we can then get fermentable sugars then that will be transformed into to, to whatever ethanol for instance uh, and typically we can also get and we've been as i said we've been targeting, targeting some of our work on the production of zero oligosaccharides okay uh, other alternatives that can be considered, for instance, is the, the sequential auto, auto hydrolysis in order to enhance the, 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 the availability, let's say, of the, 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 the processed material to, to the enzymes for further, uh, for further fermentation. Uh, and just to highlight here that... Uh, Two things. One, we started with a material that is widely available in Portugal, the vine pruning residues. As you know, you, we are a wine country, so vine pruning residues are available, at least in specific, in specific times of the year, are readily available in, and available in large amounts. And then, um, just to mention here the, on the fermentation side, that we can, and we've been working on, use different strategies for the uh, transformation of the solid that we got after the, the auto hydrolysis, okay? And we can use different strategies. One is uh, um, sequential, sequential hydrolysis and fermentation, and the other is solid substrate fermentation, okay? Um, and sorry, it's not solid substrate, it's simultaneous sacrification and fermentation. So we can have two separate steps in this, in this, in this situation, and then we can have simultaneous um, 
um, sacrification and fermentation just one vessel. Um, and in the end, we are expected to have the lignin that was available in, in, after the, the pretreatment. It was available in the phase containing the, the, the cellulose. Anyway, um, and this uh, still has lots of challenges to be solved, in particular the, when we talk about the, the simultaneous sacrification and fermentation, the, let's say the compatibility of the, uh, the optimal temperatures for enzyme activity and the optimal temperatures for the, in the case of bioethanol, saccharum acids, growth pro for the production of bioethanol. So the temperatures are not exactly the same and to match this can be, uh, it's an in, important issue. Uh, for instance, this is a, a diagram, a, a slide showing the yields we get for 100 kilograms of, uh, kilogra of vine pre pre new residues. You can get 30.1 kilograms of ethanol. You can get a very huge amount of shows, and then you can get phenolics and lignin. Okay. And you see here the, the some of the same images of the material. Uh, the original material and then after being processed in the first hydraulic step and in the second hydraulic step where it's clear a change in structure of the material. Other materials we have been working is uh, eucalyptus, Nathan's bark, using uh, argonosov and we did some optimization of the process considering the use of ethanol as the uh, solvent to be used in pretreatment. And then we move to simultaneous sacrification and fermentation. And we get obviously different results according to the to the amount of ethanol that we do that, that we are using in the treatment conditions. Okay, but anyway, this is just to go to give you an idea of the kind of things we are doing concerning the processing of lignocellulosic materials or pretreatment of lignocellulosic materials. We work with other byproducts, uh, old straw, for instance, uh, um, but um uh as i said um as i mentioned before we can use sequential steps to improve the accessibility and in the end to uh, to enhance the quality of the fine product we get in pretreatment and for that we decided to use uh, a sequential treatment incorporating liquid water, hot water treatment and organosol treatment um and using uh, as model corn cob. And the idea was to get a highly purified lignin to be further used as I, uh, and going back to the title of my presentation, to be further used in development of new materials. In this case, materials for, for packaging, okay? And the treatment was like this. So we started with corn cob, we use liquid hot water, and then we get the cellulose lignin fraction and the hemicellulose fraction, and we apply a, an argonos, organosol treatment using ethanol, a, a, a solution containing 60% of ethanol, and we use this organosol treatment, apply this organosol treatment, and we get a solid fraction containing cellulose, and we get the lignin fraction that, that is obtained by precipitation, and we get a very highly purified lignin using this technique. And this lignin is known to have a high ox uh, antioxidant activity, and the idea is to make use of this antioxidant activity. And you can see here that really this is a very interesting material concerning the, anti the anti antioxidant activity. And we compare the, um, you measure the, uh, the radical sca scavenging activity of, of the lignins we get. This is the lignin obtained by just um, uh, organosol using ethanol. And this is the lignin, what I call here a highly purified lignin, that you get by using sequential liquid hot, hot water and organosol treatment. And as you can see here, it behaves quite well compared with traditional um, antioxidants, with commercial antioxidants, BHA, BHT, and Trolox, okay? So even using two different techniques to measure the uh, radical scavenging activity or the antioxidant activity. So um, the idea is, was really to incorporate this lignin in, in films, okay? You can get films from, from using different materials, polysaccharides, proteins, and so on. 
And for development of the film, they typically need to, to add plasticizers like glycerol, sorbitol, sucrose, and water. We, most of the times you need a surfactant. And you can have uh, an additive to be added. And our aim was to use, to evaluate the possibility or the, of introducing the lignin we obtained before in the development of this film for materials and obtain a film for uh, a material with high, uh, high antioxidant activity. So, um, just to make a very short introduction on challenges associated with development of these bio-based films, some of the challenges that have to be considered include um, water sensitivity and solubility in water. So, they are typically very water sensitive and have a high solubility in water. Uh, properties like water vapor permeability have to be considered also. Sometimes they have poor mechanical properties. They can be functionalized with biological compounds, as is the case of the, what I'm going to describe. And we also have to consider safety issues and compatibility with food applications. And so, as I said, uh, we developed um, a material using as as um, let's say a main uh, using carboxymethyl uh, uh, cellulose for the formation of the film so we use uh, we develop carboxymethyl cellulose based films with incorporated argodosol lignin and we evaluated their physical chemical and antioxidant properties and really what we did is is here okay we did the produced the film using the casting method. Here is the uh, different materials we used. So well, as you can see here, we started with ethanol organosol lignin and we uh, incorporated in different amounts in these CMC films, okay? And really uh, you, you can see what we did and we um, developed some several bio-based films and really this intensity of color so sh shows in a way the extent of the incorporation of this and ethanol ethanol organosol lignin and here you can see some pictures of the um, the films you get by incorporating lignin and you can really see the, the effect of increasing um inclusion of this lignin on the on the on the films and we can see it also a self-assembling that occurs, let's say, by incorporation of the lignin on this on this um, on this on these uh, CMC CMC based films. Okay, as you can see here. Uh, really, we can see here by uh, FTIR the incorporation of the of the, of the lignin on the on, on films, and we uh, measure some of the relevant properties. Uh, as that I mentioned before, that characterized the films that were obtained by blending CMC and lignin. And really, uh, we, we measure some relevant parameters like thickness of films, the moisture content, water solubility, water vapor permeability, and also a cot the contact angle that is a measure of the hydrophobicity, hydrophilicity of, of the films. And overall, you can see really the incorporation of lignin has an impact on all these properties. And we can really conclude that the addition of lignin to cellulose-based films improves their sensitivity to water, it, what is, that is a desirable property. We also measure the thermal pro pro properties of these uh, CMC lignin, bl lignin blended films. And as you can see here, it had a significant impact. The introduction of the, the lignin had an impact on the thermal properties of these films. And we can also conclude that the addition of lignin to loss based films improves their thermal stability. Uh, also, the same happens uh, when you use or when you evaluate the me mechanical properties of this CMC lignin be based films, we, we measure relevant mechanical properties of these films, and we can see here that we have a positive effect 
by the incorporation of this of this of this lignin. Um, also, the incorporation of lignin, as I said before, uh, intended to make use of the antioxidant activity of this of this lignin, and as you can see here, the um, the, the the incorporation of the, the lignin on this on these films really improve their antioxidant uh, activity. What's really very very relevant when you consider the the application of these films in very different food materials. So uh, overall, ordinal lignin improved water resistance of CMC based films such as moisture, water solubility, and water vapor permeability, as well as their thermal stability. No significant improvement in mechanical properties observed, which may be related to the low compatibility between ordinal lignin and CMC polymer. And important, very important, ordinal lignin conferred excellent antioxidant activity to these CMC based films, boosting its use as antioxidant in food packaging films. That was really the, the, the main target of, of, the, of this work. Okay, just to, to conclude. I'd like to highlight another material that we've been working with. It's the case of spent coffee grounds, okay? Spent coffee grounds, as you know, is the major waste produced during soluble coffee preparation. And really, we generate huge amounts of these spent coffee grounds th throughout the year. And so, really, it's a linear loss material that deserves being considered for further applications, okay? And just not as a waste. And really here we did a very simple set of experiments where you we use these spent coffee grounds. We applied two treatments, an alkali treatment and uh, alkaline treatment. And from that we get different fractions that we are going to incorporate um, for development of different films. And then we apply one of these films on, on the coating of golden berry. This uh, as a special uh, PhD student that was doing this had a special interest in golden berry, so that's why we choose we choose uh, choose golden berry as as model system. Um, so um, these are the properties of the extracts, and you can see that here we have the alkali pretreatment. The extract obtained from alkali pretreatment and for, from autohydrolysis. And you can see some differences between these extracts. Uh, and if you look to the content of arabinos, this one is a higher content in arabinose. The content, this one is PB is much richer in, in mannose. And the PA is richer in galactose, meaning that, okay, the treatment to apply led to, to extracts with different properties. Uh, and the amount of phenolic compounds is more and less the same. You can see here really there was a, a degradation of the, the materials by applying different pretreatments. And also we measured antioxidant activity and um, we get close values to those that are obtained for the traditional antioxidants. Uh, the fungal growth, we really see here that uh, for smaller concentrations, we have um, some inhibitory effect, but as we increase the concentration of these polysaccharides, uh, we can really get, for at least for some fungal, uh, 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 some growth may occur. But um, the idea really, as I said, was to evaluate incorporation of these extracts. Uh, and really, we can see here the the structure of the the, the the extracts. Let's say the micrographs of the spent coffee grains extracts. And here we can see also some images of um, CMC based films. In this case, we are also using CMC based, based films uh, for the development of the, the for the, the incorporation of, of these of these extracts. And you can see really some difference occurring as you increase the concentration of the, the extract being incorporated. Uh, we made a similar approach to what has been done before for the for the extracts where we incorporated lignin for the films where we incorporated lignin, and we can also see that as expected, uh, the the inclusion of the extracts at 
changes the properties of the films, mainly um, not so much thickness, but moisture, water solubility, and water vapor per permeability. And this, these changes occur and, uh, and depend on the extract being used. It has a, an, obviously an impact on color, as you can see here. And um, what we did, as I said, in the end, we were going to evaluate the applicability of these CMC-based CMC films uh, with polysaccharide extracts obtained from spent coffee grounds on the, uh, um, let's say, shelf life of a, a specific product, a golden berry. Um, we decided to evaluate the best uh, uh, um, uh, film forming cell solution to be used. And for that, we measured spreading coefficient. And then we select this particular solution, this uh, PA alkaline extract to be used. And we evaluated, let's say, the, uh, the growth and bacteria, the growth of bacteria, both bacteria and these molds throughout time on the golden berry coated with the, the different the, 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 the different extracts. And really we can see here that coating B made of CMC with 0.2% of the alkaline extract presented antibacterial effects when used at 20 degrees and 65% relative humidity and antifungal effects were when used on golden berries at four degrees and 95% real activity humidity. Really, this extract has a very interesting uh, uh, antibacterial antifungal activity when applied on the surface of, of golden berries. Okay, and um, okay, I'm here for let's say 45 minutes, and maybe I can conclude saying that spent spent coffee grain extracts incorporating same same if, Film based films um, uh, affect the film actress and change its properties, improving or at least preserving its phys physical chemical properties. Color and opacity were the main properties affected by polysaccharides incorporation. The light barrier being significantly improved in the enriched films, and this uh, uh, spent grain and coffee grains polysaccharides had presented antioxidant and antimicrobial activity that allowed them to be used in the preparation of same as CMC based films that reflected an improvement, uh, displayed an improvement in the, uh, their functional properties as a result of the application of the incorporation of this extract. And really, this boost may enhance the possibility of using these materials on, on food applications. So, overall, what I can say is that biopolymers from lignol cellulose can be effectively used in the development of new materials. And obviously, uh, the composition of lignol cellulose can the properties of the infractions according to an extraction process can be critical, or let's say it's a determinant on the applications to be, to be developed. Okay, and uh, I'd just like to conclude by thanking for, for this uh, invitation when again, once again. I'd like also to thank all the people that in our group have been working with this, in this. And um, thank you very much and welcome one day to Braga in Portugal. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Jose. Can you hear me, bro? Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, thank you very much for that uh, nice presentation. Um, very timely, and also I think we have lots of viewers just now uh, in in our uh, Facebook page, uh, faculty UTM faculty engineering Facebook page. So um, maybe uh, to get uh, the question posted on the screen, maybe you can just uh, uh, close your uh, sharing, your yes. your sharing your chat page, so that we can read uh, questions from the audience. Oh, screen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, if secretary can you share any questions that we have? Okay, bro. Um, we have one question here. I think from yeah, this I'm seeing it. For, for this conference, 
uh, organizer from IconBed. So the question is, there are researchers who use the cellulose nanofibers or cellulose nanocrystals as re reinforcement in biopolymer composites for edible food packaging. Okay. Yes, that's another. I'd say that's another topic of research we are working. Really, we are developing uh, cellulose nanocrystals to be incorporated in in food in, in biopolymer comp composites for edible food packaging. I did not detail that, but um, we are also working on that. I think we can have some feature, feature on this. I think that the main problem is that the 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 costs for the production of these uh, nanocrystals can be still very high because the extraction yields are, are not as interesting as, as in this uh, solution we presented. But really, it's something that has to be considered. So meaning right now, uh, the the development of uh, the area uh, in this area is still very new, yeah, bro? Yes. The, the, the development in the area of nanocrystals are still very new? Yes, yes. There are some works on that, but I think there is in, there is a, a, a good potential on this, but we still need to, to improve the extraction efficiency of the process to make it competitive. Right, right. I, I remember um, the uh, sharing session b before this by, uh, I think you know Dr. Raj, Raj Bupati? Mm -hmm. Professor Raj Bupati? Yes. Yeah, he, he in his uh, session before, he did mention that uh, when you develop a process, he was sharing with, with all of us in this uh, session, uh, there will be two costs, one for the uh, upstream. Normally, yeah. upstream, you cannot, cannot control the upstream uh, cost, but you can always control the downstream cost. Yeah, so yes. any, any comments on that, Rob? Um, okay, what can I say? First of all, um, we need to have, um, let's say, the quality of materials you, you, st uh, you start working with is critical, okay? And you can never use linoclosic materials, even if it's for these nanocrystals or whatever, without seeing that in an integ integrated perspective. Uh, because, as I said in the beginning, when you use linoclosics, you have phenolics, you have cell lows, you have MS lows, and you have lignin, okay? And so we really need to see this as, um, let's say, an integrated process because we need to add, to add value to all these parts of the process, okay? To, to all these constituents of the, of the starting material. Uh, I think that the, this nanostructure can really be a, a high added value solution but I'm not sure if they still, this is still very competitive to be considered. Anyway, I think it's a pro, it's something that has to, to be to be to be let's say increased, and even the downstream processing you mentioned is a very uh, let's say um, it's not still optimized, and you need to optimize that. Okay, Rob. Rob, here I have one uh, question from my colleague in our uh, departments here. Uh, WhatsApp group. Uh, this is a question from Dr. Roha. She is asking, uh, the, the, the issue is comparison on synthetic and bio-based packaging film from economical viability. Comparison yes. between synthetic and bio-based packaging film for economic viability. For example, uh, in terms of cost, amount of production, machinery, and uh, related issues. Can you comment on that, Prof? Okay, I would say that that's a very, very good question, really. Uh, because let's say synthetic packaging are really uh, cheap, let's say plastics, as we know them, are really very cheap. So um, I'm not sure you, you are still in position to consider these bio-based films as economically viable alternative. There are lots of solutions. There is a lot of work being done on that. But um, we still, uh, I don't, I'm not sure it's still a very competitive solution. What's happening nowadays a, a lot is trying to also to improve the synthetic materials by incorporating some functionality on the on these materials. Yeah. And so there, are, I would say there are two alternatives. One is to reduce the costs uh, and increase the, the let's say the the, the functionality, the, decrease the production costs and increase the functionality of the let's say the the bio based films. Okay. And uh, there are some interesting solutions, but they are not so spread yet in the market. 
and the, what is being happening now also is another research research line that is to increase the let's say the, the properties of synthetic films of synthetic plastics by incorporating some some functionality also so there's a balance between this and I, I think that we have to go both ways and in the end find what's the best solution yeah when you mention about increasing functionalities do you mean like increasing feature like antioxidant property as well yes 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 for instance yeah and making making even those intelligent materials intelligent packaging let's say uh, maybe the one that can mm -hmm. uh, uh, detect when uh, some uh, uh, material goes uh, uh, have been rotten or something change or pH or something like that. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, why I mentioned about that? Probably because in UTM here, uh, especially in 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 this school, School of Chemical Energy Engineering, we have one uh, research group. It's called uh, Food and Bio Material Research Group, mm -hmm. who are uh, studying on this. Okay. Yeah. So they, they have uh, come up with a uh, packaging material which they call a smart smart active switch smart. or something. Yeah, yes. smart packaging material because uh, those packaging materials are incorporated with a uh, um, natural. Uh, I think they use. Um, there are some compounds that are sensitive to pH and change the color, for instance. Yeah, yeah. So they are developing that. So uh, we are yeah we are very welcome to uh, maybe get. Um, get in touch with this kind of sure, sure. Sure. yeah so hold on prof let me see if there's any other who sent me a private message a question okay so do we have any okay we have one question bro from uh, associate professor dr malaviri balakrishnan she's from our school of biomedical engineering here so she's uh, saying that thank you prof for your good presentation how do you think we can apply the internet of things approach into food biotechnology okay i would say that internet of things is everywhere <laughs> nowadays yeah so i think it can also go to, to food biotechnology really because uh, we we can get so much information we, there are so many information we can for example in packaging we can include so much information packaging materials and so on and we can really track everything and we can really make use of uh, Let's say Internet of Things to get information for 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 for, for the story of food products for, for, for food biotechnology applications. That I think that sooner or later it will be spread all around. So I think that kind of approach right now is available uh, within the producers, yeah, bro, but not to do to the end user like us who are purchasing stuff from 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 the store, yeah. So hopefully one day we'll be able to see. Yeah, I think that. Uh, both producers and also us as consumers can make can have some benefits from this uh, in, uh, internet of things because um okay for the producers really it's good because they can track everything yeah 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 it's but very... also for us as consumers we can track the history of the product because the information will be there yeah Maybe just by using QR scanning QR code or something. Yes, for instance, visibility. Yeah, yeah, I think that by by by. Okay, we have the bar, the, the traditional chart, the bar, the bar chart. I think yeah. we can really go far ahead from by using this Internet of Things because I think we can really, as a consumers, get a lot of information. Yeah. Using this these new technologies. Okay, bro. Uh, I think we have reached uh, at uh, 5 p.m. here and I think 9 p.m. in your place now. Yes. Can we have one last question and can I reserve that for, 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 for my question here? Sure. Okay. When I, I saw your one in your presentation slide just now, you mentioned one of the uh, possible applications for lignin is for uh, adhesives, adhesive for? material. Yes. Adhesive, yeah. So can you elaborate a little bit on that? Maybe you have some uh, done studies on that? Is application as adhesives? No, we did go for that. I think that it, it is one of the alternatives that has been considered just even before, let's say, this biotechnology processes. Uh, I think that lignin has been studied as an adhesive, but I don't have really, unfortunately, I don't have lots of, in, of information on that. But I know that because of the content in phenolics, uh, that can be interesting as an, as an adhesive. 
Yeah, because I know some 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 group here they was studying that kind of area and saying that uh, it can also add to the calorific value of the um, yeah. material. Yeah, but, yeah, but lignin traditionally, when I started working on this, was just burned because of yeah. the calorific value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, bro, I uh, really like to share. I have two questions here, actually, by my friend here. But we already reached to the end of our session, actually, bro, because it's already like 5 p.m. here and 9, 9 a.m. over there. Yeah. So I think uh, just to wrap up, uh, I would like to, on, on my uh, uh, SMC, uh, I would like to thank you again for your time and for agreeing to share your valuable experience with us especially uh, students and staff researchers in UCT of Malaysia. So hopefully to be able to see you again in other events. Yeah, yeah I really hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so to, 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 to conclude, uh, may I invite again our distinguished Dean, Professor Rafiq, to uh, conclude the session. Over to you, bro. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zainal, for sharing the session uh, and for introducing Prof. Jose Antonio Texera to me. And to our distinguished speaker, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to give a lecture very early in the morning over there in uh, Braga. Uh, thank you for sharing a very nice slide about uh, Portugal, about your place, about Braga. Uh, very nice, uh, very nice place. I'm sure that uh, Zainal and I would be so eager to, uh, to be in Portugal uh, once the pandemic is over. Uh, yeah. Anyway, such an interesting uh, lecture. We have uh, uh, more than 200 viewers for this particular live session, and I'm sure there will be hundreds more watching this webinar afterwards during their free time. Uh, so thank you again uh, for accepting our invitation and for a such great lecture. And to all of you watching this UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series, thank you so very much for watching. Until next time, bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you once again for, for everything for the invitation and for listening to me and i hope we'll meet in person somewhere sometime yeah <laughs> in, in braga perhaps in braga yeah. okay great okay bye -bye. thank you bye bye